everyone. I am glad to see you. I hope that you all are having a wonderful day wherever you're tuning in from in the great Allegheny West Conference or even beyond our borders. We're excited to have you for this installment of our virtual camp meeting. I get to kick it off with you all and I'm asking that you would just light up the comments right now. Let us know how excited you are to be here in this space. I'm excited to be here with you and I'm asking uh, any prayer requests that you might have going to drop them. We'll go through and keep you all in prayer. And if you see a prayer request in the comments, what I'm going to ask you personally to do is pause right where you are and type a prayer on behalf of that person. Let's interact in here and let everyone know that we've gathered together under the unction of our Holy Spirit to receive a word over the course of this camp meeting experience. I get the opportunity to join with you today in the book of Revelation in the first chapter. Uh, a very wise individual by the name of Winnie the Pooh often says, start from the beginning. And so since we're starting in Revelation from the beginning, I want to start us off right. We're going to understand the book of Revelation, what it means, how to study it, and see what God has in store for us, not just here in this book, uh, excuse me, in this chapter, but throughout the entire narrative of the book of Revelation. And so in order to understand Revelation really, really well, we have to understand chapter one and what God is saying to us there. So, if you'll allow me, I want to read arguably the most important verse in the entire chapter of the book of Revelation. But first, I'm going to ask you to pray with me that God would give us unction and inspiration as we study. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here in this virtual space and in this digital camp meeting. God, we're asking for an outpour of your Holy Spirit across all the messages, all the songs, all the conversations that we have that at the end of this experience, we will be drawn even closer to you. We thank you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all type amen. Put your hands together. Let me read to you the most important verse in the entire book of Revelation. Ready for it? Here it goes. Revelation chapter 1 says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent it and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant John. Verse 2 says, who testified the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Uh, 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 he says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. Now I said that verse 1 of chapter 1 was the most important book, excuse me, verse in the entire book of Revelation. And some of you are asking right now, I can hear you communicating with me uh, prayerfully, telepathically. I can hear you where you are. You're asking, how could you say that this is the most important verse in the entire book? I'm glad you asked me because this holds the power of our interpretation in its hand. Verse one of chapter one starts out with a very simple clause. That clause is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to get this. Oftentimes we look at this and we interpret the text. I'm gonna give you some really big terms and whittle them down. We interpret this clause, this, this phrase, this verse uh, as a subjective genitive when really it needs to be interpreted as an objective genitive. Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm glad you asked me. Watch this thing. When you understand uh, uh, these terms, the text will open up to you in a way it never has before. Y'all stay with me. This thing is so incredible. A subjective genitive means that the, uh, the, the, the thing that is spoken about is the subject of the sentence versus an objective genitive, which means that the thing that is spoken about or referenced is the object of the sentence. Let me use this as an example. Uh, this is the Bible of BC. Now, if we look at this as a subjective genitive, then what we're saying is that, uh, that, that the Bible, uh, it belongs to me, but the focus of this sentence is in fact me. Uh, 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 in an objective genitive, the focus is on 
the Bible. And I want you to see this now. When the text speaks, if we look at it as a subjective genitive, the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm not using big terms, so stay, stay with me. It'll get clear. Subjective genitive, the revelation of Jesus Christ. What we are saying is that Jesus Christ is doing the revealing. Jesus Christ is unpacking for us the mysteries of history. Jesus Christ is showing us the things which must come. And in an understanding that this text is written in a subjective genitive, what we know is that the book of Revelation is simply Jesus showing us what is going to happen in the future. Jesus mapping out information and facts and figures that we must internalize to be on the lookout for things. However, when you understand the revelation of Jesus Christ to be an objective genitive, then Jesus is no longer simply pointing out facts and figures in the prophetic narrative for us to internalize, but rather Jesus is now the focus or the object of the revelation. Y'all don't get this thing yet. So when the text says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, what we need to understand is not that Jesus Christ is revealing, but rather Jesus Christ is being revealed. I love this interpretation. Because then we understand that the entire focus of the book of Revelation is, in fact, Jesus Christ. It's not the dates. It's not the times. It's not the happenings. You should not read the book of Revelation without coming away with a clear, beautiful focus on Jesus Christ. The songwriter says, uh, turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face that the things of this world might grow strangely dim. And I believe that John wants you all to have that same understanding. Yes, things are going to happen in the future. Yes, things are happening right now, but there's no need to fear. There's no need to be afraid. There's no need to worry because our focus, our attention is Jesus Christ. And because he is our focus, all of the things that are happening can grow strangely dim. We don't have to worry. We don't have to be afraid because Jesus is our focus. Watch this thing. But also, it reveals to us the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Watch this. Things are revealed in the book of Revelation. There are uh, historical uh, uh, facts and figures that come out of the, the, the narrative in the book of Revelation. But what this means, since Jesus Christ is the focus, this is good, y'all. It means that Jesus Christ is so intertwined with human history. He's wrapped so tightly around us. He has drawn so close to us and is so intimate in relationship with us that it is impossible. Y'all hear this. It's impossible to reveal Jesus Christ and not see human history. History. It's impossible to illuminate Jesus Christ and not see what happens to the people that are in relationship with him. I wish you guys could get this thing. I love the analogy of uh, pretend that I'm a giant and I'm stretched out, laid down across the entire state of Ohio. And because I'm a giant, uh, uh, part of me, uh, my head is in the northern part of Ohio. It's up there um, uh, in Akron and in Cleveland. Uh, and it, it's, it's, in, it, it's, it's at the top portion of the state. But my legs, my toes, if you will, are all the way down in Cincinnati. Y'all get this picture. If you were to take a helicopter and fly over the state of Ohio, and your purpose, your desire, your intention was to use the spotlight of the helicopter to illuminate me. You wanted to see me. Because I am laying down in the state of Ohio, if you use that, that spotlight and shine it on my toes, yes, you'll see my toes, but you'll also see the, uh, the city of Cincinnati because I am literally wrapped up in the state of Ohio. You'd fly a little higher and you'd, you'd take a look at, at, at my shins or, or perhaps my knees and the city of Columbus would be illuminated to you. Uh, you, you, you would see my, my arms and, and as you see my arms, you would also see Toledo. You would also see Dayton. If you flew up and, and looked at my head, you would see Cleveland and Akron. Uh, this would happen because I am literally laying down across the state and it is impossible. 
It's impossible to illuminate me without illuminating what is around me. And I believe that because Jesus Christ is so intimately intertwined with humanity, it is impossible to reveal Jesus Christ. It is impossible to illuminate Jesus Christ. It is impossible to highlight Jesus Christ. I wish somebody would get this thing. If you get it, type it in the comments, type impossible. It is impossible to see Jesus Christ without human history also being revealed because Jesus is, oh, and we'll get to this. He is, he exists now. He exists uh, before the beginning began and he will exist in the days to come. He is exhaustive in our history. And as you highlight him, you also see what's happening to the people that are in relationship with him. I love this thing because now I can approach the book of Revelation without fear. I can approach the book of Revelation without trepidation or without dismay or without worry because as I study and as I dig into the passage and see what God is revealing in there, I am drawn into a deeper and deeper relationship. I wish you guys were with me with Jesus Christ who loves me and cares for me and gave himself up for me. The text opens up with that notion, this objective genitive. This is the, rela the, the revelation of Jesus Christ. I love that thing. And as Jesus is being revealed, uh, he begins to show us what happens in history. Now, now, preacher, I've never heard this before. I'm uncomfortable with what you're saying. I don't know if, if I can hang my hat on that. I believe uh, that when you approach Revelation with that notion, that the text itself begins to make more and more sense. You see, uh, uh, th there are three parts, three sections, if you will, in the chapter uh, that we're in today, in chapter one of Revelation. And the first section, which we just, re just read, has set the tone for the entire book. It lets you know what the focus should be, what, where your attention should lie on Jesus Christ. The second section begins this message that John has to the churches. And the third section uh, begins the interpretation or the, the, the extrapolation of that message. So section one, which you just read, it tells us the focus and the tone. Section two lets us know that John is writing to the churches uh, 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 in the book of Revelation. And the third section tells us what he is writing. That section begins the rest of the narrative of the book of Revelation. So watch this thing. Let's see if now our interpretation and understanding can make this text, this passage, come to life. I love this thing. Uh, uh, verse uh, 2 and 3 told us that this revelation, which we now see, is of Jesus Christ and not Jesus Christ revealing. Uh, it has an origin. Watch this thing now. Uh, if it were Jesus Christ doing the revealing, stay with me, then Jesus Christ would be the origin or the start point of said revelation. But according to the passage that we've just read, uh, verse two says, uh, uh, excuse me, verse one says that this revelation came from God. It came from the first person of the Godhead. It came from the Father. It originated with him and was given, y'all with me? It was given to Jesus to give to his bond servants. And so the rest of this passage gives us the trajectory or the path that it took to get to us. It originated with God the Father. It was given to Jesus Christ who gave that message to his angel. That angel then gave the message to John, the revelator, John, the one who is on the Isle of Patmos. And John then gives that same message to the churches uh, that he maps out throughout this book. John also gives this message, uh, not just to the churches, but also to us. And so we see the line, we see the path that this uh, message has taken along its journey. And what it highlights is that Jesus Christ must be revealing and not revealer, excuse me, must be revealed and not revealer. God the Father wants us to understand who Jesus is, what he's done for us, what he's doing for us, and what he will do for us. God wants us to see Jesus in a way we've never seen him before. And so it starts with the Father and he says to us, listen, I want to communicate to you 
who Jesus is. And so now that we understand that this is about Jesus, this line makes so much more sense because God wants us to hear all that has been accomplished in his son. And so he's passing that information on to us through John. John now says, mm, blessed is he, blessed is the one, blessed is she, blessed is the individual who reads the passage, and blessed are those who hear the word. John is speaking, remember now, to the churches. And so he's talking in a church relationship. The one who reads is the angel of the church or uh, the, the pastor or the overseer, the individual who is hosting the Revelation Bible study, the one who is the small group leader. Blessed is the one who reads what is written here in this prophecy. But also, he says, are blessed are the ones who hear the words of the prophecy. So get this now. Revelation must be understood to be a revealing of Jesus Christ, but it also must be understood as a revealing of Jesus Christ in the relationship of the body. God is informing his church gathered together to receive what he has for them, who Jesus is. And in light of who Jesus is, we see what Jesus does. Now, Verse four gives us the beginning of our second section in chapter one. Verse four tells us who is writing, John. It also tells us who he's writing to. Stay with me, y'all. To the seven churches that are in Asia. Which are these seven churches? I'm glad you asked me. Those churches will be named later on in the passage, so we don't have to guess. But watch this. Before he tells us who those churches are, he has a blessing to give to you. This is good to me because so often we open the book of Revelation and we begin reading in fear. We begin reading in trepidation. We begin reading with worry on our heart, guilt on our heads, heavy and laden. But John starts out by saying to the seven churches that are in Asia, and I'm telling you today, uh, to the churches that are hearing this message, even today, even now, right where you are, John has a message for you. He says, grace to you and peace. I love this thing. Let's pause really quickly. I know I got a message to preach, but I can't get past this thing. He wants you to know at the inception of this message that there is afforded to you grace. There is afforded to you grace. I'm going to say it again. Type it in the comments. There is afforded to you right where you are grace. You don't have to worry. You have grace. God's grace, if I can borrow from Paul, is sufficient for you. And in light of the fact that you have grace, he says Peace. Y'all be at peace. Don't be worried about what you see in here or what you think you see in here. Don't be worried. Nothing can touch you. Nothing can harm you. I'm actually showing you in the, in the discourse, in this narrative, how close I am to you and therefore how protected you are in me. So be at peace. Peace. Who is this peace from? Who is this grace from? He answers it from him who is and who was and who is to come. It's not just from him, though. It's also from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And this grace and this peace is from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. John wants you to know that you can have grace. You can have peace because you have all of heaven at your side. All of heaven is in your corner. All of heaven has your back. No matter what the world might throw at you, no matter what you might be afraid of as you read through the book of Revelation, no matter what you think you might hear that should cause you to be upset, he says all of heaven has got your back. So be at peace. Grace, y'all, this is good, has been afforded to you. Y'all type grace in these comments. Grace has been afforded to you. All of you watching from Grace Community SDA, y'all better type grace in these comments. Grace has been afforded to you. It's been afforded to you. So watch this now. Uh, since we have this grace and we have this peace, John now gives a lauding or a praise to the one through whom this grace and peace has been afforded. Yeah, let me take my time in here. He says, grace and peace to you. Uh-huh. And so then he says, therefore, to him, to him, 
to him who loves us, to him who released us from our sins by his blood, to the one who has made us to be a kingdom and priest to his God and his father, to him, he says, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Listen, he is celebrating Jesus Christ even now in the very beginning of this book in chapter one. I need you all to get this. The focus, the attention in Revelation needs to be paid to Jesus. If you are reading Revelation and you are coming away from the book of Revelation with anything else aside from a solidified foundation in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are reading outside of the illumination of the Holy Spirit. John has made it clear three times already in this chapter, Jesus Christ is the focus, Ooh, this is good to me, of the book of Revelation. He continues now and says, behold, he is coming. Mm, Y'all, look what John has started out with. I'm speaking to those who have been, who have spent years afraid of engaging the book of Revelation. Look at what John wants you to see here. John says, he is coming. The one that we spent six verses talking about, he is coming coming. That's what I want you to see here. He's coming and he's coming with clouds mm. and every eye will see him. Even the eyes of those who pierced him. Everyone is going to behold the lamb who is both lamb and lion. He says all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. It's finished. It's solidified. I agree with this, John says. And now he has a message directly from the one who he's speaking about. He says in verse 8, uh, in case you're unsure, in case you don't believe me, usually in the Bible, uh, when you see letters written in red, it's the words of Jesus. So Jesus himself, in case you don't believe me, shows up to speak to us in this passage. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Y'all, these aren't cliche, cute, little flowery terms. Jesus isn't showing up to be a preacher. He's not speaking poetic. He's not waxing eloquent. He's using very intentional terms. Alpha and Omega are literally letters in the Greek alphabet. And what Jesus has basically said to us is, I am the A and I am the Z. I am the Alpha, and I am the Omega. I am the beginning, y'all still with me, and I am also the M. He says, uh, 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 I am the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. I am the Almighty. That's, that's, that's powerful. In case you, ooh, this is good. In case you believe that Jesus was some pathetic, puny individual wrapped in a loincloth. He is asserting himself for you in this passage. He wants you to know that you can have grace and you can have peace and you can have assurance based on who he is as you are in relationship with him. Don't, don't, be, don't be afraid uh, and don't be mistaken. I'm, I'm bigger than you've made me out to be. I'm the alpha. Yeah, I'm the omega. I'm, I'm, I'm the one who was and the one who is and, and the one who is to come. I am the almighty. I am Jesus Christ. I love uh, how Ellen White says this thing, how, how, uh, how divinity flashed through humanity as he spoke. I am outside the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is speaking in the same authority now. I am the almighty. What are we afraid of as we read Revelation? When we read it in the lap of the almighty. Y'all, John picks us up now in verse 9. Our third and final section in the book of uh, Revelation, in chapter 1, our third and final section, John begins to now tell us the message that he told us he would tell us about in the second section. Y'all still with me? If you're still with me here, if you're watching from your phone, put some wave emojis in the comments. Let me know you're still here with me. Uh, John says in verse 9, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus. Let me stop. Let me stop. Let me stop. John says, I'm writing to you and telling you what I'm going to tell you. But I need you to know uh, uh, what condition John is writing in. John says, I am your brother 
and fellow partaker. John is saying, I'm with you. I'm going through this with you. In what, John? What are you partaking in with us? John is saying, I'm your fellow partaker in the tribulation and in the kingdom and the perseverance which are in Jesus. Listen, y'all, don't miss this thing. The, per, the, 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 the tribulation you're going through, we go through together with one another. We're not by ourselves. John is writing, oh, don't miss this thing. John is writing a message to the churches. He's not writing a message to the individual. John is establishing us in relationship with Jesus Christ, but also in relationship with each other. John wants us to know that, that even removed from us physically, he's bearing the same burdens that we're bearing. And his tribulation that we accomplish, that we go through, that we fight through together. Not just with each other, but also with Jesus. It's not just tribulation that we partake together in. This is good. But we also partake together in kingdom. We also partake together in being celebrated as God's kingdom, one with another. But then we also partake together in the perseverance. In, in standing shoulder to shoulder, I, I wish I could borrow from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the fiery furnaces that we face, in standing shoulder to, to shoulder, I wish I could borrow from, from Daniel, in the various lion's dens that we might find ourselves in, in standing shoulder to shoulder, if I could borrow from Esther, in the throne room of the king that we are not sure will accept us. John says that we are partakers together in the perseverance, in the kingdom, and in the tribulation. So now he begins to map his own specific tribulation that we're partaking together with him and he says I John your brother fellow partaker in tribulation in kingdom in perseverance which are in Jesus which are in Jesus I ain't got time uh, um, uh, he says um, I was on the island called Patmos some of y'all familiar with this I don't have to go too in depth in it but John was was sent to Patmos because they couldn't kill him they wanted to, uh, we always say to boil him in oil, but in my mind, that just says fry. They wanted to fry John, and, and, and John could not be killed, so they exiled him on the Isle of Patmos. John is writing to us from the Isle of Patmos, and he says he's there because uh, the word of the Lord, uh, which he was preaching, and the testimony of Jesus. Now, let's, let's unpack this thing. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. Let's unpack this thing because I want us again to be able to better understand what the text is saying. Because going forward, we have chapter two, three, four, five, six, seven, etc. And if you don't have the foundation in one, all of this will be will be Greek to you. And so I want you to get this. Oftentimes, when people uh, interpret this passage, they interpret it to mean that John is saying that he was in the spirit on the Sabbath. It's not what John is saying. I love the Sabbath. It's not applicable here. And if you think it's saying that here, you won't understand what John is actually saying. Uh, the, 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 the ancients, um, those who, who were the early church, they would often, the Jews would often refer to uh, the coming of the Lord, the, the last days, the, the end of days, when, when, when the dead in Christ shall rise first, according to Paul, uh, when we who remain shall be caught up in the twinkling, uh, when this world comes to an end um, and he establishes his kingdom, the Jews would refer to that, the early Christians would refer to that as as the Lord's day or the day of the Lord. And so when John says that he is in the spirit on the Lord's day, what John is saying is in the spirit, he has been taken in the spirit. He has been allowed to view in the spirit. He has been transported to the day of the Lord. And John is saying in the spirit, I was on that day. And so now I am writing to you what I saw. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, hearing a loud voice, y'all, hearing a, a, a voice like the sound of a trumpet. This almost a, a, a explicitly echoes um, First Thessalonians chapter four, uh, when the when 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 a voice a uh, 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 shout, uh, the voice of God, uh, the archangel, the trump of God, it's almost echoing. 
what we have there. John is saying, I was transported in the spirit. I was allowed to view the day of the Lord. And so now I'm writing to you in this book what I have seen. In fact, I've been commanded. A voice told me right in the book what you see, right? What is happening on the day of the Lord and write it and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus. Ephesus, listen up to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So he turns, y'all, I wish I had time. He turns to see who is talking to him, and he sees an individual standing in seven golden, uh, uh, in the middle of seven golden lampstands. Don't miss this thing. He's clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across the chest with a golden sash. Don't miss this thing. For those of you who are uh, uh, sanctuary scholars, the text is using sanctuary language. Jesus is standing amidst the seven golden lampstands but he, he he'll inform us later what these lampstands are but he's dressed he's dressed y'all as a high priest so he's standing in these seven golden lampstands the, the work of the priest was to make sure that this lamp continued to burn it represented God's work in our lives he's dressed as our priest standing in the midst of these lampstands and he, he's, 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 he's he's described oh wish I had time he's described as an individual head and hair uh-huh white like wool like snow don't miss this oftentimes Time we'll have conversations about Jesus' race, um, how he looked. That's not what John is saying. In fact, if you read the description, it doesn't describe any race. This is not a human being that John is seeing. It says hair and head, hair and head, white like wool. It's not describing texture. It's describing color. He is so bright. His head and hair are so white hot. Um, uh, his his. His eyes are literally on fire. His feet were like the flame of, 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 of excuse me, uh, like, like burnished bronze that had been made to glow in hot fire. He is on fire. Is that describing a white man? Not a black man? Not a Hispanic man? Not an Asian man? It's, just, it's not describing a human being. It's describing an entity that is indescribable, that is literally on fire with the flame of God. I'm moving quickly, y'all. Uh, the text says that this individual speaks with the voice of many waters uh, in his right hand he holds seven stars and, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword you don't have to worry or wonder about what this is the text will explain it to us I'm almost done y'all uh, uh, the text says that when John saw him he falls to his feet drops on his face like a dead man but this white hot entity I'm done y'all puts his hand on him says don't be afraid that's good in the book of Revelation this powerful, this inexplicable entity shows up, puts his hand on John, puts his hand on you, right where you are, says, don't be afraid. I'm the first, I'm the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forevermore. Here, I'm holding the keys to death and hell. So since I'm here, all powerful, telling you not to worry, I need you to get up and write the things you have seen. Let's close with this. He says, um, some folk are gonna ask, what did it mean? So as to the mystery, he says, of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, uh, and the seven lampstands, watch this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. I'm done, watch this thing, I'm done, I'm done. I closed it so you know I'm done. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. And when John sees him, he sees him standing in the middle of the seven churches. Listen, despite the tribulation you're going through, whatever's happening in the revelation of your life, Jesus wants you to know that he's standing in the midst of you, he's tending your flame to make sure that your fire, Ephesus, your fire, Smyrna, your fire, Thyatira, Philadelphia, Pergamum, your, your fire does not and never will go out. I am here to keep you burning. And the seven stars that are in my right hand, in the hand of power, according to the Jews, are the seven angels of the churches, the, 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 the ministers I have sent to you to do work in you, through you, by you, for you, with you. They're in my right hand. Listen, Jesus starts out by saying, I am the focus of this book. 
And while I'm the focus of this book, I want you to know that I exist in relationship with you. So what does that mean? What does that mean? It means that as you continue your journey through the book of Revelation, as you continue your journey through the book of life, I need you to know that despite what may happen around you, despite where you may find yourself, despite the desire to be afraid, there is an entity called Jesus. Can't be explained. White hot with the power of God. He exists in relationship with you. Where can you find him? You can find him right now in your midst. I know, I know. In a few chapters, we're going to hear some scary things. But they're only scary because we haven't seen them from the vantage point of individuals in relationship with the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, the almighty. And so horses, chariots, scorpion, demons, wormwood, dragons, beasts will come. But I want you to know that before we saw any of those things, this is good, don't miss it. Before we saw any of those things, we saw Jesus. And we saw Jesus in relationship with us. We saw Jesus in the midst of us, standing with us, keeping us on fire, keeping us burning, keeping us thriving, serving us as our high priest, making sure that though the mountains may rise in our lives, I'm borrowing from you, Beverly Burton, the seas may roll and cover me, though the ground may move from under our feet, we're standing with him and our fire will not go out. Though the clouds may block the sun from our way and, and disappointments may spoil your perfect day. He's standing with us to make sure our fire will never burn out. Those who he has sent to minister to you, your pastors, your priests, your elders, he says, I'm holding them in my right hand, hand of power. I love this. I'm reminded that Solomon says to us in Proverbs that the hand of a king is like channels of water in his hand, he turns it whichever way he desires. God is in control. He's the first thing we see, uh, and I want you to see this, he's also the last thing we see in the book of Revelation. In theology, we have a term called inclusio. And what that term means is that oftentimes something will start us off and end us up. Uh, somebody will talk to you uh, in a little bit in, in, in this book, and you'll find out that Jesus Christ is not only the first, the starting focal point of the book, he's not only the last focal point in the book, but he's also the central focal point in the book of Revelation. Listen, he wants you to know that he's with you. It's impossible to see Jesus truly revealed without seeing the entirety of human history revealed because he's so close to us. But that ain't the point. That's not what's being revealed. What's being revealed is that he has you. Israel Houghton says that he holds your world in his hand. And he wants you to know that that is the truth of the book of Revelation. So in the Revelation 1 of your life, in chapter 1, right where you are, I want you to open your heart, open your mind, and accept Jesus Christ as the first and as the last. And I believe that as we read this book, that he will open it up to us like a blossoming flower, that we might see his mysteries clearly, and that we might know where we are in relationship with him, and that we might join ourselves to him in the way he desires. 
that we do. Allegheny West, right where you are, will you pray with pray with me? Those of you who are joining us from outside of our fellowship, will you also pray with me? Lift your hands right where you are. Father, we thank you for showing us the mystery of you. God, you're unraveling your wonder before us in the book of Revelation, allowing us to see who you are and who you desire for us to be in relationship with you. God, in just a little bit, you're going to unpack to us the messages to the churches. And what we're going to find in those messages is you, where you are and where we are in relationship with you. God, you're either going to be confirming what we've been doing and telling us to hold fast, or you're going to be pointing out where we have strayed from you and calling us back to you. But God, you are the focus. In just a little bit, God, you're going to break some seals and you're going to reveal to us what those things mean. But you want us to see that you are the only one who is able to break those seals that you purchased for God, men with your blood from every tribe and every nation and made us to be a kingdom and priests to our God and we shall reign. So worthy, worthy is the lamb to receive glory and honor, dominion and power. God, I'm asking today, we are asking today with our hands outstretched in this moment that you would fight through the minutia, that you'd fight through the noise and that you would be our focus. Not just in this moment now as we're reading the book of Revelation, but in the revelation of our lives as we leave the house today, tomorrow, the next day, as we interact with our friends and family, our spouses, our children, our parents, that you would reveal what a relationship with you in this moment looks like and how it should cause us to position ourselves that we might reveal you to those around us. We thank you that your Father had a word to give to us and he passed it to you. You saw fit to give it to your angel who gave it to John, who wrote that thing down for the churches and that through the churches we can also see the message that you have for us. We ask that you would bless us and keep us and continue, according to Revelation 1, to pour out grace to us, to afford peace to us. And we'll be careful to glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for spending this time with me, for celebrating what God is about to do in the book of Revelation. I can't wait to see what God reveals. And I pray that you're as excited as I am, that you're as ready as I am, and that we look forward to the blessing that God's gonna reveal. Thanks for spending the time with us here, and we look forward to seeing you in our next message. Until then, grace and peace.